shortened in any way. So we're back in Genesis. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll get into Genesis 9, starting in verse 18. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the people that you created through your word that we know as the church. Uh, many of us, maybe all of us, wouldn't even know each other in, unless it was for um, your word drawing us to faith and committing us to um, your Savior, Jesus Christ, your one and only Son. And so we thank you that you've bonded us together. We thank you for this fellowship, and we thank you for the love that you show us through your continued teaching in God's Word. I pray that you would open our hearts to your Scriptures and your Scriptures to our hearts, not something that we can take for granted and something that only happens by your Spirit. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I know all of you are either kids who had an upbringing that you remember to some degree and how your uh, parents dealt with things that you did that were wrong in action or an attitude. And we've got a lot of parents of different generations here as well. Um, we have lots of young parents with brand new babies and having more. We have parents of teenagers. We have parents of adult uh, kids that are now having kids that are getting married. So all across the board. And so there's applications here for everyone, but I'm trying to draw a point out about your attitude when you're in responsibility over something in relationship to, to other people. So for example, um, and particular because it's a subject matter, uh, when one of your kids did or does something wrong or has a bad attitude, how seriously do you take it? And my point is not about to like chastise you for not taking serious stuff. I'm really asking because some things you'll take more seriously than others. If your kid's kind of dejected and just having kind of a, a bad attitude in a day, you might not give them some big consequence. You might sit them down and say, hey, what's going on? And maybe take it less seriously than other things. So one of the actions that my wife and I take very seriously, and it didn't take any effort to get unified on this one, was when any one of our toddlers would run out onto a busy street. It's just automatic. You know, we do do spankings, and so it doesn't matter how young the kid is. If they're running out, they're getting an automatic consequence. The reason for that was, and I think regardless of exactly how parents apply consequences, most parents would agree, that's a very dangerous thing to do, and it's almost negligent not to teach your children. And much better for them to get a hand slap or something like that than to have a flat toddler, right? Much better. So, and I had, I had, I would have these like mini visions of my kid just getting hit by a car. I'm like, not going to let that happen. So I'm going to make a very serious impression. Most of our kids would stay away from those streets immediately. Some of our kids, I think I mentioned the name too often, so I'm not going to, because he'll probably someday watch these sermons, uh, would step right up to the edge, you know? So now you have an attitude issue because he knows he's not supposed to do it, but he's pushing the boundary. So do you, how do you deal with that attitude? And my goal is here not to tell you about all of the ways that we parent, but so that's one action or attitude that we would take very seriously. I don't want you pushing the boundaries of being near a curb next to a, a, a dangerous street. I don't want you on that street. But there are other things that you may not um, take as seriously. I think one more thing that most parents take seriously is, um, let's go with teenage kids. You know, uh, we have, and, and a lot of you know, raising teenage kids is not easy. Some of you are in that right now. I'm not quite there yet. But uh, I still remember in junior high, uh, the issues that kids are facing, the temptations are far darker than people know. I think it was like in seventh grade that I started noticing people drinking and getting drunk and then hiding it from their parents. And so what do you do if you find out that your teenage kid is hiding like that, something like that? You know, it's alcohol or drugs or something like that. I mean, at Lake Oswego High School, um, it wasn't talked about and it was hidden, but there were a bunch of kids that were using cocaine in junior high, or well, not junior high, in high school, right? So they graduate from some of the more acceptable, at least societally ones, and, and, and went that far, and um, I, I don't, you may have never been part of the underbelly of like the uh, nightclub scene and things like that, but it gets very dark when you're starting to buy drugs like that from people. Those drug dealers are very unsavory people. They're only like one degree removed from people who will kidnap you, so it gets very dark very fast, and this is something. So how seriously do you take that? I guess most Christian parents probably take that very seriously, especially if your kid's lying about it. So you got an attitude problem of lying, an action problem of actually taking drugs or getting drunk and using alcohol, and it's a little bit like stepping out onto a busy street, because you know, especially if they're around permit age, if they're drinking and the next thing they're driving, oftentimes kids don't, they don't know how serious the consequence of their actions are. 
And so you want to make a really serious impression. Now let me downgrade it to something that probably most parents take less seriously. Um, what happens if your parents or your kids, we're pretty close to Christmas still, have a rotten attitude about gifts they're getting? How seriously would you take that? They haven't actually done anything in action in terms of wrong, but they see a gift and they're like, oh, this isn't the gift that I want. So you have a, a gratitude. Like most of our kids are getting, you know, better gifts than just about any other kids in the whole world, right? Americans are very wealthy comparatively. And so how do you take that? And now I'm not actually saying this is the standard, but for, for whatever reason, and I think I know the reason, it's, it's biblical in nature, but uh, I, I can't stand it. If we make an effort to get all these gifts for our kids and they are ungrateful about it, and Christine can't stand it either. And so we've told them, hey, if you're ungrateful, we're just gonna stop opening gifts and we'll have to resume later, right? We haven't had to do it since we said that. Um, and, and here's the interesting thing though. Does that discipline, does that threat in any way actually transform their hearts? No, it never does. The rules never, they're not meant to. The law and consequences for the law are never actually meant to change hearts. But you ought to still enforce them because they reveal something about God. God doesn't just let you get away and bad attitudes and getting away with them, we'll find out have generations worth of consequence. So much worse than we thought. A bad attitude that you just leave alone can grow into something that becomes a generational feud. It's terrible. It's unbelievable the far-reaching consequences of just sinful attitudes. I think it was Winston Churchill that said, an attitude is a small thing that makes a big difference. And that's almost an understatement. It makes a, an absolutely enormous difference at times. Uh, both towards blessing and towards cursing, we'll find out. So, in, in, in short, the reason why I brought this idea up of how seriously do you take the sin of those that are in your charge or anybody's sin, um, and how seriously should you take it? Just as seriously as I take it? Well, no, not necessarily at all. Really, it should be, you should be looking at how serious God takes a sin. And you can only know that based on God's word. And I will say, at least in my experience, but probably also based on what scripture teaches, um, we don't tend to take the things God calls evil as seriously as he does. Not even close. So we, we th well, well, it's, yeah, you know, it says it's evil and this leads to death, but it, we tend to be shocked when we find out the consequences for someone making these mistakes are exactly what God said they were and they're terrible. I think, oh, that's harsh. Even though God made it very clear, it's really that bad. Right? If it's murder or kidnapping or some heinous crime, usually like, that's really bad. But if it's something like dishonoring your father, which is a sin that Jesus had to die for to redeem, we usually have a lower view. And the same thing when, when God calls things good, we tend to not see them as good as God sees them. And so what we need to do is we need to align. A passage like this is going to be very difficult to accept and understand and feel any kind of peace about if you're not aligned with how seriously God takes certain sins and how good certain things that he's commanded actually are. So we align ourselves like that. Only person who was ever perfectly aligned like that is Jesus. He loved righteousness and hated wickedness exactly the same degree that God does. And so we need to do that. I, I will make the bold statement that you're not going to like this passage if you're significantly misaligned with God's hatred for evil things and his love for good things. So the whole reason I brought that up is that we need to align ourselves in our parenting, in our relationships with other people, and especially in our relationship to God with what he sees as evil. Um, my main point today is just about attitudes because this passage is so much about attitudes. And uh, I've got it written down here. It's a little bit uh, longer than a normal um, uh, main point that I have, and that's probably just because I haven't been in the pulpit for a while and I'm rusty. But here it is. Only the cross can lift the curse of sinful heart attitudes and exchange them for blessed ones. Only the cross can lift the curse of sinful heart attitudes and exchange them for blessed ones. You can go ahead and leave that up a little bit if people are copying it down. So with those ideas in the back of our mind, that only the cross can lift these sinful heart attitudes and that we need to take those sinful heart attitudes as seriously as God does um, and the blessed ones the same way. With that backdrop, let's jump into Genesis chapter nine, verse 18. And just as a little preamble, um, God had just 
brought Noah and his family out of the ark. The world had been flooded and it's now within this and the next chapter starting to be repopulated. And so we zoom in on Noah and something that he did in verse 18. And the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah and from these people, or excuse me, from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. And Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And uh, I think, you know, not that it's ever good to have experience with drinking to excess, but I have quite a bit from college, all in a time that I was just blatantly walking away from my faith and really angry at God and in a lot of ways rebelling. Um, when you drink to the point where you lay down and have no consideration for propriety and you're completely naked, that's what college kids and most people call blackout drunk. Like you're just gone. It's not oh, sort of drunk, but like you're so drunk that you don't even know what you're doing. You just, you know, you end up in places you don't remember being, don't remember the last thing you're doing. So he got good and drunk. I think it's not the right thing when pastors or scholars try to downplay what Noah actually did here. It wasn't good. Um, and so what I'd like to do is spend some time talking about the idea of drinking and alcohol in the first place and what the Bible says about that, what it doesn't say about that, and what our heart attitudes towards drinking really ought to be. Uh, Christians historically have sometimes gotten this wrong um, on the end of legalism, forbidding all drinking altogether and judging those that do it. And Christians have also gone wrong on um, basically diminishing how dangerous alcohol can be and thinking, oh, I have this freedom and then using that freedom for a cover-up for evil and saying, well, I'm not getting drunk, I'm just getting tipsy and next thing you know, they're living lives of dissipation where drinking is really the thing they've become uh, in love with rather than God. And we'll find out which one of the very first verses I wanna read to you and we have it up and these days the uh, team's so good usually get it up before I can even go. This is Ephesians 18. Uh, excuse me, Ephesians 5, 18. I'm gonna go ahead and read it out. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. That's Ephesians 5, 18. We find out there's actually a negative correlation between you being filled with the Spirit and being drunk on wine. They're not both simultaneously possible. Filled with the Spirit is different, biblically, than being uh, inhabited by the Spirit or indwelt by the Spirit in the first place. That's something that happens the moment you come to faith that you can never lose. He comes to permanently reside in your heart. So it's one of the marks of the New Testament, one of the major differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the filling of the Spirit is more like the relational power you have when you're surrendered to Him. And that can ebb and flow. I've heard it explained a thousand times by my dad, either like a circuit or like a water heater. The pilot light's always on. But at times when you're sinning and grieving the Holy Spirit or quenching his power, the water's not being heated or the circuit isn't closed. So it doesn't mean that when you sin, let's say you got drunk, you lose the Holy Spirit. It's not a thing, not in the New Testament. But it does mean that you would be quenching his power in your life. And until you confess that and recognize that it's actually sin, because it's commanded not to be done, that you would uh, be again filled with the Spirit. It's a biblical doctrine people oftentimes uh, get, um, get messed up or just haven't really learned a lot about. But regarding the drinking, we can, when I say universal conviction in this sermon, that means everyone that's a Christian ought to believe this thing from the Bible. So we ought to all believe universally that it's a sin to get drunk. That's a universal conviction. Right? Now, there are also personal convictions. For example, the kinds of foods that you eat are biblically a personal conviction. So we have to ask ourselves, does the Bible teach the idea that drinking not to excess, not to drunkenness, is that in the, in the category of a universal conviction? Well, a past you know, Southern Baptist prohibitionist would have said, no, that's a universal conviction too. No Christian should ever drink. And I think that errs on the side of legalism because scripture stops short of saying that you should never drink or that alcohol is inherently a sin to imbibe. So let, let me actually go to a passage that talks about this. This is, uh, we're going to go to Romans 14 before we go to uh, 1, or 1 Corinthians 11 because that's just the, way, um, just the way it's coming out. So if you've got your Bibles or if you want to just look at um, 
Romans 14. Romans 14 is a classically misinterpreted passage, not in a terrible way. I think the ultimate application is still faithful to scripture, but oftentimes the way people apply Romans 14 in relationship to drinking has nothing to do with what Paul's talking about, and I want to show you that. The, the oftentimes the major application that's given by well-meaning Christians and Christians I respect, uh, it's, it's not some kind of terrible false teaching. Like I said, in general, it's based biblically faithful, is that Romans 14 is about not drinking around alcoholics, at least in part, not drinking around alcoholics. Paul's not talking about alcoholics at all. What he's talking about is different convictions about eating foods and drinking in general. We'll see that. And some people in the church have a conviction that a certain food should not be eaten by any Christian and that alcohol should not be touched by any Christian. They've made a universal out of something that should be a personal conviction. And Paul has something to say about that. And it's unbelievably interesting how it's actually about our attitude. If somebody is being a little bit too legalistic about something like food, you shouldn't be eating that food, you shouldn't be drinking that. Um, by the way, it's not legalism to say it's a sin to get drunk. That's just truth. But if somebody's saying, listen, nobody should drink, and for everyone it's a sin to drink, um, the, the, Paul is actually worried about us not passing judgment on one another, including the person that has what I would call an overcooked conviction on something. Something that's been cooked a little too hard. It's, it's just beyond that. Even if it's just a little bit legalistic, Paul's concerned about us not judging one another. And so I'm going to read this, but what Romans 14 is actually in part about is you have a, a brother, in this consider, he considers this someone who's weak in their faith, who has a universal and somewhat legalistic conviction that you can't eat this food can't touch that, it's a rule-based thing, or you can't have this drink. And how should you relate to them if you realize that actually you do have the freedom, I mean, if you actually do, if it's your personal conviction that you can have alcohol biblically, then you have that freedom. And you, it, it, Paul actually says, let no one speak of what you know to be good as evil. So you realize you're not supposed to agree that no one could ever do this. But how should you relate to that brother? That's the point. Not somebody who's an alcoholic, but someone who's become a legalistic teetotaler. By the way, let me just say one more thing. I deeply respect personal Christian convictions to never drink. I have close friends who have had fathers who have died of alcoholism, a very close friend, who actually uh, is one of the people that after I stopped rebelling, the defensive end that I led to faith, um, it's partly C.S. Lewis, partly uh, my testimony that, that God used. And um, he decided never to drink again in that moment and to this day has continued. I, that is a respectable, that's not a weak faith when you keep it personal conviction. That's not the point that Paul's making. It's when someone takes it to you over universal. So let me read to you what Paul actually says and you'll see how this is the context. Verse 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 13. And you can read 1 through 12 at home too and you'll see that it's all in line with the context I'm talking about here. Verse 13 says, Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in of itself, but it is unclean if anyone who thinks it is unclean. I want to stop right there. If you think alcohol is unclean for you or if food is unclean for you, God honors that conviction and it's unclean for you. About to see that it would actually then be a sin for you to go ahead and take part in that if you have not changed your conviction. That's, that's really interesting, the idea how that God would sometimes individually apply these things. Verse 15, for if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. What's Paul concerned? Paul's not concerned with you being like, oh, you're being listed. Are you, I have these freedoms. I should be allowed to do whatever. He's actually concerned with you being worried about another person's conviction about how you behave because we're in relationship to one another. Isn't that interesting? Let's continue. If he's grieved by what you uh, eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is clean indeed, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. 
It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Remember, what is the stumbling? A brother has a conviction that no Christian should be drinking. You're drinking around them. Maybe you tempt them to drink themselves or maybe you just harm their conscience and upsetting that conviction. And so just don't. It's actually not about the alcoholic. See that? Now, obviously, I think it'd be faithful to say someone who has such a serious problem, you would also cause them to stumble potentially by, by drinking around them. So I uh, would not do that personally. I would advise people not to do that. But in this case, it's actually about relating to each other when we have intense and conflicting convictions about something that's in the personal realm. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whatever he does, forever does not proceed from faith is sin. See what I'm saying? See what Paul's saying? You see how attitudinal it is? Your relationship to alcohol starts with an attitude. It's not just about, well, getting drunk's wrong, but in moderation's okay. If you've fallen in love with alcohol, but still have a relatively disciplined relationship with it, so you haven't become an alcoholic and you don't get drunk, but you're going to parties and if there's no alcohol there, it's like, nah, this isn't gonna be fun. Something wrong with your attitude. There's a sinful attitude there. If you condemn other Christians who may be a little bit legalistic or just have an overwrought convictions about that, rather than considering how your partaking in your biblical freedoms might affect them, that's not the loving attitude either. So it's so deep, much deeper than just a yes or no, if that makes sense. I wanna take you another place because so many of the places in scripture that speak about alcohol are really about an attitude and not about the surface level yes or no, but about an attitude. So here is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This one includes communion. And I think that's why it's... Uh, uh, there's so many passages I go to about alcohol, but I thought I'd go to the ones that might be most relevant to the church, our relationships, and to, uh, and to what probably needs to be understood for this passage. So this is 1 Corinthians 11. It's only the major passage we'll go, and then we'll come back to uh, Noah and what, uh, what Ham did. Verse 20, when you come together... It is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. That's an intense thing to say to a church. You're not doing communion. What you're doing, not even close. That's what Paul's saying. And he's an apostle. He's commissioned by Jesus. He has authority. What he's saying is true. For in eating, verse 21, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. You know, I think there's probably uh, some truth that... Uh, in those ancient times, some of the um, wine that people were drinking was unfermented. In this case, in Corinthians, the church, that was most certainly fermented wine. You don't get drunk off Welch's grape juice. This is not possible. So, and uh, unfortunately, I know that from experience. So, long time ago, thankfully. But... Um, they're getting drunk, they're gorging themselves. What was really happening in context is the wealthy people were getting the best seats. They were not letting the, the less wealthy or less fortunate to uh, get anywhere close. They're in a smaller house. And so they go in and when communion happens, they're hammering the wine, hammering the food, and there's none left for the poor. So listen to what he says. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body which I give to, is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in the Lord of the Lord in unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. That's a very, very serious thing. Okay? Now, it would be unbelievably irresponsible for Paul not to rebuke them for using fermented wine if that all by itself was the sin. This is most certainly the passage that he would, but that's not actually Paul's concern. The getting drunk is, the wrong-hearted communion is, the non-communion that they're doing. So and it's the antithesis of communion here. His concern is their heart attitudes that's leading to this terrible sin. Let me continue reading. And so therefore the solution is this, verse 28. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. And I could continue here. But the idea is that um, this is about communion primarily, but it's also about the idea of, of wine at communion. And so you can see how, again, it comes right to the attitude. Examine yourself. When we come to communion today, it's not examine yourself, find out you have some sin, and then decide don't have communion. You're supposed to surrender it. That's the implication. And say, I'm sorry for that bad attitude that I had. I'm sorry that I have been gluttonous and been selfish towards other people in relationship to context, but there's so many other things that might be going on in your life. Maybe you haven't forgiven somebody. Maybe you just need to forgive somebody before you come to communion. Keep a clear account. And so um, I don't think it's right, uh, wrong to have uh, fermented wine at communion um, because that's not what Paul corrects. And uh, it's what I believe Jesus actually instituted them with. So I'm not going to say much more. Maybe one other thing, because I thought it'd be interesting for you to find this out. Um, this is uh, an idea that's still relatively new to me. But in, in Proverbs 31, I'm generally not very favorable towards um, some of the ways that uh, uh, pharmaceutical drugs get prescribed. I think they get overprescribed, and I think I'm also not a psychiatrist, so I don't really take what I say here with too much authority. I'm not the person on that, but I just, from what I can see, people are using it in a way that's, I think, abusive even in the medical system. And so when my wife had, uh, the only uh, labor that my wife had that was really, really terrible, you can ask her, a lot of the labors were like 45 minutes and so much faster than you would expect and just amazing how, how she was able to have kids. But Ariel was um, back labor, terribly painful, terribly long, absolutely just exhausted her. And uh, they say, well, one of the best thing we can do now, the baby's out, it was natural birth, is give her fentanyl. And I was like, fentanyl? It sounds like that terrible drug that people are lacing heroin with in the streets in Detroit. Like, no, not fentanyl. It's like, hey, no, this is really fast acting. It's better than the other ones like morphine or Dilaudid, the really powerful ones. And uh, so they gave her fentanyl and she went bye-bye really fast. And uh, listen to this verse because you might think, well, is it okay for Christians to have fentanyl in a medical situation? Painkillers in general, is that okay? Listen to what the Bible says about this. Verse six of Proverbs 31, give strong drink the one who is perishing, and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. This most certainly doesn't mean help poor people get drunk. I'd be really messed up. <laughs> don't do that. I'm talking about people who are dying. And at that time, I don't think they developed morphine or things like that. And so there are anesthetizing um, properties and pain reducing properties to certain um, compounds and like alcohol or fentanyl, things like that. And when they're used, again, with the right attitude, was Christine trying to get high? No, she wasn't trying to get high. It was a severe level of pain that could be managed for comfort's sake. Don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, that's probably significantly beyond the scope of Noah, but I thought I'd bring it up because um, when I discovered something like that and actually was. Um, a good friend of mine, Larry, in our Bible study that mentioned that verse, and I thought, wow, that's really applicable. I'll share it. So let's go back, and uh, the one thing that we've most servantly established is that it was sinful for Noah to get drunk. We can all agree on that. But no point in pretending like it wasn't. Might as well just let the word say what it does. But God's focus in this passage is not about Noah's sin. It could be. People getting drunk is the focus of uh, uh, of God's story in other parts of Genesis. We'll find that out um, with Lot and his daughters, for an example. But in this case, God's not focusing in. What he's wanting us to teach about in this case, what he's wanting to teach us about in this case is not about how bad Noah's sin was, but about how bad one of Noah's son's reaction to his sin was and the consequences of that, right? God is not saying it's okay to get drunk here. He's saying it's a different focus. So let's look at what the focus of the Holy Spirit is here. And it has to do with the differing reactions between the brothers. Here's verse 22. And Ham, well, I'll read 21 again. And he drank of the wine, became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. And if you just left it with that altogether and had no comparison of the difference between the reactions between Ham versus Shem and Japheth, um, I think it would be harder to understand why Ham's heart attitude was so sinful. But when you see what the other brothers do, it's more understandable. Then Shem 
and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So they had such a high view of honoring their dad. They, didn't, they not only didn't want his sin to be exposed, they didn't even want to say it, and they're covering it. This is not a passage we should use to cover, saying, oh, covering up someone's sin uh, is, is okay, especially when there's other victims. But this, however, is uh, to some degree, at least humanly speaking, a victimless sin. And there are scriptures that talk about, for example, Proverbs uh, 17. I'm gonna actually let our team put it up and wait for it. I think we have Proverbs 17. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats the matter separates close friends. You ever had somebody gossip about you and next thing you know, people don't really want to hang out with you more and years later you find out it's because someone said something negative about you and they believed it? Gossip like that separates close friends. I was thinking about, you know, sometimes we'll have large family get-togethers with Christine's family or my family and none of, none of any of our family members are really given to alcohol, so this is an unrealistic scenario. But let's say one of my brother-in-laws uh, got, um, brothers-in-law got, got drunk and got blackout drunk, and I wake up at 5.30, and he's out in my lawn naked. And then I wake up the whole house and say, hey, so-and-so is naked outside, Right? That would destroy his reputation with the entire family. It'd probably go beyond that family. The shame would be intense. Is that the loving thing to do? Or would the loving thing to do would be to wake up my brother-in-law, get him on the couch, get him some water, put a blanket on him, and then maybe have a conversation with him later about, hey, what's going on in your life that you got blackout drunk like that, right? You can see the spirit of Shem and Japheth was one of love towards their father and honor and Ham's was one of dishonor and spreading it and exposing his father's sin. How many fathers feel loved by a son that trumpets their sin to the world? None. And you see it happening all the time these days. You don't want, and the, as soon as you have a kid, you realize, wow, there's a lot of things they could say about me to other people that I don't really want to have happen. When you're the son, you think, well, I'm better than my dad, so I'm not going to do that kind of thing. And then God humbles you over time. You realize you're not that great, not as a son or a dad. So there's the sense in which what you're going to hear next might seem A, unfair, B, extreme, but the first thing that we need to do is remember, although it has not yet been commanded, it is still part of God's nature, um, that uh, one of the commandments, you remember the commandment that we ought to honor our father and mother, that we might live long in the land, and Paul actually says that it may go well with us? Well, the opposite of that is dishonoring your father and mother. Right? So it's the opposite of the blessing. Less life and things will not go well with you. And then we're shocked when people dishonor their fathers and mothers, biblically or in your life, and bad consequences happen like what's about to happen next. So first thing we ought to do is remember that God has a very high value that Shem and Japheth agreed with and Ham did not about honoring your father and mother. And that means honoring them even when they're committing a sin or have recently committed a sin. It's not just honoring them when they're nice. And I realize that can be very difficult if your parents were abusive or if you had a terrible situation at home, but there's still a way to speak about your parents that is non-judgmental and loving rather than hateful and contemptuous and exposing their sin to everybody in the world. Something that God hates, he takes it very seriously. It's a cursed attitude to dishonor your father and mother. As a young child, or even as a uh, older child who refuses to take care of their parents when they need you. These are cursed attitudes. So we ought not to sh be shocked to hear what happens next. Um, although some shock, I think, is due and God knows it. So what happens here is that when Noah awoke, verse 24, from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, "'Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be to his brothers.'" Now, had he said, cursed be Ham, this sermon would be a lot shorter. <laughs> it would be a lot easier to explain. One of the real difficulties here is that the curse falls on his son Canaan and not on him. And the natural response is, well, how is that fair? How is it fair in the first place? And so we need to look at some scriptures biblically to understand. the very Again, this is another area where we need to have the right attitude in, in going to scripture. When you react to like, that's not fair. God knew you were going to react that way. 
Romans 9, Paul actually sets up a scenario of the exact same reaction. How's that fair? You can read it. So God knows. He's trying to elicit that reaction. And it, it makes you, if you're being faithful, think, okay, I'm not getting something here. Because God's always fair. You can't break that boundary. So let me read you a couple things that we should consider boundaries. This is from Ezekiel. This is a passage, especially today, you ought to know, because the world is no longer agrees with this. Maybe never did. This is what it says. We started in 19. Yet you say, the Israelites, the culture around, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. God says it's not right for the son to suffer for the iniquity of the father. Who these days is saying that ancestors, uh, that you can have ancestor guilt over and over and over again? Black Lives Matter, CRT, you can be guilty if you have some kind of slain older father, father, not even maybe great, great, great grandfather, right? If you had someone that did something deeply wrong that you're related to, you're guilty for it as well. There's no bridge like that in the Bible. You have to commit the sin yourself. Listen to what he says. The soul who's, excuse me, yeah, verse 20, the soul who sin shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked person, our world can't handle this next sentence, but if a wick, wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That's God's justice, okay? So that's a boundary. Ham was not going to be punished for his father's sin unless he committed that same sin, okay? That's not going to happen. That's not what's happening in that passage either. Something different is happening. So let's go back, let's read, and let's consider. I need to gather my thoughts here for a second as well. <clears throat> So we still have this issue. It's like, well, so what about, what about Ham? Uh, and what about Canaan? And why is Canaan being cursed here rather than Ham? How is this fair? Well, there's another verse that you need to know about. This is Exodus chapter 34. I should also have it up. And this is when Moses asked to see God's glory and he passes in front of him and God declares his own name and attributes about himself. And this is famous. Verse six, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, in some translations, for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Some people will say, well, that's a contradiction of Ezekiel. They can't both be true. He just said the soul that sin shall die. Now he's saying he's visiting sin again. I have a history, uh, as far as I can tell, it started with a great-great-grandfather in Switzerland, but probably went back even farther than that, of uh, fathers and husbands who were basically rageaholics, hardened, hardworking, honorable Swiss farmers, but man, they had a severe temper. And I still remember my dad telling me stories about my great, my grandfather, Lawrence Winston Gehring, and it's really interesting. My dad is not an angry man, and the sin of his, his father has not been visited on him, and there's only one reason, and it's the main point of this sermon. It's the cross. My dad repented, and my dad did have those anger issues, and biblically, you cannot simply say that that was just a matter of nurture meaning just a matter of having watched his dad's thing. God spiritually applies these kinds of sins in cursing kind of ways from father to son all the way to the fourth generation. But if the son repents, he's not found guilty. Do you understand? Faith interrupts that terrible cycle. But we ought not to think, well, it's just a father, like father, like son. It's too uncanny how similar that sin is. And by the way, when I was in rebellion, I turned into my grandfather. I was a rage monster. And people sort of glorified it when I was a football player because I would play so violently. They loved the gladiator kind of thing. But man, it's not helpful as a pastor. It's not helpful as a husband. It's not helpful as a father at all. There's no benefit to having used anger in that way. 
And so e even though it could be not applied to my dad, it could still be applied to the third generation if I don't repent. Can you see the boundaries? No, you're not held guilty for things you repent of. Yes, God does actually visit sin generationally. That's why you oftentimes see an anvil of sin falling through the generations and you just beg that God would bring it to an arrest through, through repentance. Now, I think this is partly what's happening in relationship to um, this, but I think there's another way to look at this. This is actually still a punishment for Ham. It's a curse on his legacy. I think there's few things that men care about, especially as they grow older, than leaving a lasting and powerful legacy. Legacy of mercy and, and love and service to the, to the uh, church as a, as a Christian. People, men, care about their legacy. And here, a part of, of Ham's legacy through Canaan is actually being cursed. And instead of thinking it just as a curse, or the blessings as just as a blessing, we have to understand them as prophetic curses and prophetic blessings. That means that God, through Noah, is revealing what's going to happen through Canaan. And it's going to be terrible. If you know anything about the rest of the story, we won't get that deep into it throughout Genesis, but if you keep reading on, the villains of the promised land are the Canaanites and the Philistines. We'll get into the genealogy of that here. And the things they do are so wicked. The curse comes true. God is revealing prophetically what's going to happen. And it is still a punishment to know that as a father. Now, do you know that there are Canaanites in the genealogy of Christ? Rahab is one of them. So did this curse on Canaan and his progeny, his children, his children's children, uh, break any of the rules of God's justice or his scripture revealed? Not at all. If one of the Canaanites repents, they're forgiven. So there's no injustice, zero unfairness. But I want to say one more thing, and this is a thought that came to me as a result of discussion. I'm a verbal processor, and discussing scripture is really helpful for me. I realized that the reality is biblically that everyone born of a woman, there is no degree of inheritant, inherited innocence that makes God cursing someone unjust, with the exception of Jesus, of course. No one who is born of a woman deserves not to be cursed. That's a negative way of saying it. Let me put it a, a hard way to understand. Everyone sins, earns a curse. And everyone sins. So if we have this attitude of entitlement or some kind of false doctrine about the idea that we are born innocent or that God sees us as innocent, remember what it says when God first brings Noah um, out of the ark and he makes an altar before the Lord and the Lord and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. He just repeats the statement, he still sees it. Evil from his youth. That's not why God decided not to flood the earth again. It's just his mercy. So biblically, we don't deserve to be blessed, and we do deserve to be cursed, and so nothing unfair is actually happening. The only reason you would ever escape a curse is by faith in the one who wasn't deserving a curse and who took that curse for us. And let me go to Galatians chapter 13, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 13, to show you that. This is what Paul says about him. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? The law reveals God's good character and what he says. And we should already know. We shouldn't be killing each other, lying to each other, stealing from one another, coveting each other's things. Coveting. We know all of these things by conscience because we're made in the image of God and yet God teaches us them. And even though he teaches us them, we break them and transgress them, and so a curse falls on us. For you to not have a curse on you, you would have to never have sinned or transgressed his law. And there's not a human being apart from Jesus has ever done that. And so Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So you get to exchange your deserved curses for blessings by faith in Christ and faith in Christ alone. That's where that point came from. I'm not just making it up. That is the truth. So I hope that helps because I personally, although initially when I first read this passage many years ago, thought, how is this fair? I've come to the conclusion that everyone deserves to be cursed. I've also come to the conclusion that God will never hold children accountable for their father's sin or vice versa. I've also come to the conclusion that God does spiritually uh, pass along the sins, but that repentance interrupts it. 
And I've also come to the conclusion that God is prophetically revealing the future and the evil of Canaan and his progeny through Noah's prophetic curse. I don't want us to stay on the curses though because he says he also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and, the, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let, the Can- and let Canaan be his servant. And so one of the consequences for Ham is that his legacy is going to be through his children, one of hard service. And we see that coming true as you read on in the scriptures. If you're doing our Bible reading, you'll see that these prophecies come true. And the blessings on Shem and the blessings on Japheth are so great. They're in line with what we hear about Abraham, where God is promising him that his children will be more than the sand on the sea and, and more than the stars in the heavens. And so anywhere Hebrews go, they, uh, they're, they're blessed in a way that is really special and still continues to this day. And so this blessing, there is a blessing in obedience. It's still not earned blessing. It's not like Ham and Japheth with, yeah, we deserve this. It's a blessing in relationship to the Lord that he applies and that's triggered by obedience. So when you honor, honor your father and mother, it's not like you've earned a blessing, but God says you'll get it anyway. It's amazing. And so you can do that right now. You can do that right now. Let's say you spent a lifetime dishonoring your father and mother. You can ask God for forgiveness. So the sin of that then gets applied to Jesus. And this very day begin being blessed by the Lord by having honoring attitudes toward your father and mother. It's an amazing thing. It's, it's an immediate thing where when you repent, these blessings start coming true in your life. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years, and the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Now, I'm going to read through this um, genealogy and then make a point about even in this genealogy, we see the point about blessed and cursed attitudes and things that happen. And I have a map that's up, and while I read this, I want you to try with your eyes to start locating some of the names that you see here. Is that large enough for you guys to see? Probably not. I... um, yeah, there's nothing we can do about that. I will, I will turn because the uh, confidence monitor is too small for me to see and actually just point out geographically where these are. This is obviously a zoom in on part of Africa, uh, the ancient Near East, a little bit of the Mediterranean and some of what would be modern day Turkey or back then uh, Babylonia or Assyria up top. The time frame of the map is this exact period of time here of, of Noah, when they're first populating the, the earth again. So from Noah all the way to, um, let's see, who's the last? Joktan, right before Abraham's, Abraham's lifetime. So an ancient time, the scholars are not perfect at uh, saying exactly what that time is, but it's, uh, it's not long after the flood. I mean, as soon as Shem, Ham, and Japheth were having sons, um, and I think it actually says a number of, I'll read it, um, of when they started having sons in one of these genealogies. So let me read, and I'll start pointing out some of these names. And, and one of the reasons this is important is that it shapes our worldview. Um, every single race in terms of ethnicity, so from the lightest-skinned future Anglo-Saxon Vikings to the darkest-skinned African to Asians and Asian Islanders, uh, Arabs and Indians, all people that look significantly different and that these days we classify by ethnicities or race or nations in that way or tribal groups, all come from these people. So I don't know if you, if you read a little bit in, into it, there's a son whose name is Egypt. That's where Egypt came from. And you can know that with certainty because it's God's word. You have to guess like archaeologists do. Most of this ends up being corroborated by archaeology. Uh, nothing's ever been provenly false. So God's word always turns true. So let's read. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. You'll see actually at the very top, if you were closer, Magog, Gomer, and even Ashkenaz as well. And although it's not with absolute certainty, I assume that... Um, the ones that are closer to the northern became northern peoples. The ones that are closer to the west or to the east became people that, um, there's no real reason to believe that those weren't the people that spread out from there. And I think that's the way it's written and ought to be understood. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, Targoma, the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dedanim. From these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans in their nations. We'll find out the reason for why they had different 
different languages later. At this time, they still had the same language. It's the Tower of Babel, very next story we're going through that, that causes that. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Um, if you were looking closely, you would see Put just above at the top of Africa, Egypt, right where you'd expect Egypt to be. And uh, let's, let's continue. And Canaan, the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, and Septeca, the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod, by the way. I think if, if you would like to have this, um, this map, maybe I'll print it out for next time, or if you give us your email, we can send it to you. This is just the map from the ESV study Bible. They've got lots of great study Bibles. And some of these, these names and their placements are the best scholarly guess. So don't necessarily take it as absolute gospel that that's exactly where each person was. Some of them are really obvious, but not others. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first of the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. We don't really use the word Nimrod that way anymore. <laughs> it would have been really cool if it stayed mighty hunter before the Lord. Um, but I remember uh, the defensive coordinator at Oregon State during uh, training days at uh, Oregon State my first year there. Um, he just had a string of terrible words to call me. And the only one that I can tell you that's safe for church is Nimrod. <laughs> and there were a lot of adjectives right before that word that I would not repeat, probably in any context. Um, so no, it's no longer used. <laughs> no, don't, don't call someone a Nimrod thinking they're going to understand. Maybe, maybe Bible nerds would, but uh, that's about it. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, and Kale. So we're learning the foundations. Nineveh becomes really important to other stories in the Bible, and it's important to know the origins of these places and where they come from. From the land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, and Kala, rest in between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludum, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuhim, Pathrusim, Kasluhim, from whom the Philistines come, and the Kaphtorim. Um, I want you to pay attention to this verse 14 in a second because I'm going to stop there. Kaslohim from whom the Philistines came and Kaphtarim and then just the next couple of verses and I want to make a point that applies unfortunately terribly controversially but really importantly to a worldview that Christians ought to have today and unfortunately don't have um, founded well enough but genealogies like this will help. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn Heth, and the Jebusites and the Amorites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Archites and the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zamorites, the Hamathites, and after the clans, the Canaanites dispersed. Go ahead and put that image up, please, um, of the, the white supremacy image. Okay, so this is uh, pro-Palestinian uh, protesters with an image that says that the existence of Israel as a nation really amounts to white supremacy. And I want to show you from even just genealogy like this how that's utter historical nonsense. It doesn't even make any sense. There are no connections in that way. So first of all, um, the, anybody really considered white is basically Anglo-Saxon. And if you do your history work, it may be some other mixtures of ethnicities in there, but it's basically Vikings and the English, Anglo-Saxons. That's who's considered white. But all of these clans from whom we'll find out, you know, just a little bit later in verse 21, to Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Jepheth. You know why we call it anti-Semitism? Because it's anti those who uh, are, have their ancestor as Shem, Shemites. That's where anti-Semitism comes from. And so this anti-Semitism, it just happens to be a really incongruent and nonsensical one, and I want to show you that. So, and I actually, in this case, I wouldn't consider Wikipedia really an authoritative uh, place to go, but it does show you that the world generally agrees with these ideas genetically as well. Um, so, for example, I want to read you, in recent years, genetic studies have demonstrated that at least paternally, Jewish ethnic divisions and Palestinians are related to each other. You know why? Because Canaan is Shem's nephew. And it says it right here. It gets even crazier than that. Um, Arab-speaking Levantine, Levant is like ancient Middle Near East there, uh, such as Palestinians, Druze, Lebanese, Jordanians, Bedouins, Ashkenazi, Syrians, uh, Iranians, Moroccan Jews are all very closely related in terms of DNA studies have shown. This one is from the, um, uh, oh, what's the, what's the name of it? This is a picture, but it's the World Health Organization. Archaeologic and genetic data support that both Jews and Palestinians came from ancient Canaanites. 
We know that that's, they're actually, it's, it's actually true because, because Jews did actually intermarry against God's will with Canaanites. In general, these Jews are descendants of Shem, right? But some of them intermarried, so it makes sense that you would see genetic similarities in there. So really, I mean, Canaan is Shem's nephew. By the way, the Philistines and the Canaanites get the most mentions in what becomes the promised land as, uh, as tribes. And these tribes are so wicked. It's child sacrifice is one of the major sins that they commit where they're burning their children in the fire to gain the, um, gain the favor of demon gods, Molech being one of them. So there's just great wickedness there. Well, anyway... Um, the, the Jewish people and the Palestinian people and the Arab people in general are unbelievably closely related. So what does white supremacy have anything to do with them? Because none of them are white. None of them are white. Right? Not, not in the promised land, not in that area. Maybe in the people that, that uh, spread out from there had different genetic makeups that end up turning into that, but none of them are. And so that helps, at least in terms of my worldview, and I hope yours as well, to recognize that the conflict in the Middle East is not actually related to race at all. That's a, that's a false narrative that will be pushed. I do understand you know, if someone's watching this and is uh, more persuaded of the exact opposite worldview than I am, it's like, oh, well, we're using white supremacy as really a narrative of the oppressed and the oppressor. But the fact is you're still putting the word white in there and it has nothing to do with this context. There's no white supremacy involved in the establishment of Israel as a nation, and that has not anything to do with their conflict in the first place. And you can see it right here. These people are related by blood very closely, all of them. The conflict is spiritual. So that... I don't know if you realize that, but you study a genealogy really close, you figure these things out. So there's great depth in these genealogies. Let's continue. And the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. To Shem also, the father of all their children of Eber and the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arphaxed, Lud, and Aram, and the sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arphaxed fathered Shelah, Shelah fathered Eber, and Eber were born, two Eber were born, two sons. The name of one was Peleg, which by the way means division, for in, the days of that, uh, in those days his, the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Juktan. Juktan fathered Almodad, Shelef, Hazarmeveth, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, and Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All these were sons of Juktan. The territory in which they live extended from Mesha in the direction of Sephar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So now, I don't even think it's an overstatement to say that to some degree, I would say to a significant degree, Ham's dishonoring attitude was one of the things that contributed to the never-ending wars in the ancient Middle Near East and in modern days today. That's what started these feuds, right? I don't think it's worth really dabbling in what-ifs, but in this case, I think it does highlight something. If this had never happened and had never been such a prophetic curse and there... Um, uh, on, on Ham's legacy, then it's possible that these uh, Canaanite tribes would have never gone so far away from the Lord and wouldn't have had to end up being wiped out in the conquest of Israel when God gives them the land. So there's so much world, it, like it has geopolitical consequences to have an unrepentant bad attitude. Geopolitical consequences of generations of death. That's how serious it is. That's how serious it is to dishonor your father and mother. We ought not to have a lower view of that. And so if you're like, wow, I feel so guilty about it, it's like, well, communion is right there for you. It's when we see how sinful certain attitudes actually are and, and, and the preaching and the reception of that preaching is by grace through faith, we recognize just what Jesus had to do to forgive us in the first place. He had to take on generation-destroying sinful attitudes. Attitudes that to this day are causing blood feuds between nations. 
It's so much more serious than we really realize, and it's so much more gracious and so much more glorious of what we're actually forgiven for. And so consider, as we wrap up today, Maybe it's overwhelming to think that your sinful attitude is going to you know, destroy the generations of your future descendants. And maybe that's too much for you to consider right now. But maybe you would just consider, listen, I can hear that it's going to have bad consequences. So if you have an unforgiving attitude or an attitude that's unwilling to go to somebody and say, hey, I need your forgiveness. Or if you have a terrible attitude towards your boss or terrible attitudes towards leaders in the church or leaders in a past church, you can get free of that. You can get grace right now. It does not have to be this generation destroying sin. And you don't think that it's, well, it's not going to go that far. When someone fails to obtain the grace of God, this is the author of Hebrews speaking, a bitter root springs up and it defiles many. Have you ever seen someone that has a bitter root? They're just bitter. They're constantly negative. Everything turns into a negative thing. And sooner or later, when you do something that reminds them of that, that bitter look gazes on you. It's like a cold icy, hardened anger, and it destroys reputations, and it ruins fellowship, and it's so serious. I, I have friends that are telling me about that very thing happening in a church that they used to attend, and it's splitting the church right down the middle. You know, maybe adults can handle and heal from that, but you know, kids learn about how painful that abandonment is. Well, that was my friend, and I don't understand why I don't get to see that person anymore when people just walk away from church and People don't walk away from church when things are okay relationally. They walk away when things are unhealed, unforgiven, unbroken, unreconciled, and that starts with our attitudes. So we have an unbelievable opportunity today to come to communion and to have our attitudes cleansed. And as Emily comes up here and leads us in worship, these songs, they can be used by the Holy Spirit to to open our hearts up, because it's, it's scary to let go of attitudes sometimes. Sometimes we have attitudes towards people that are protective. Oh, if I forgive that person, they'll take advantage of me again, that kind of thing. So I would just tell you that it's so much easier, so much simple, simpler, and so much less destructive to just come to communion and ask for forgiveness than to let that ride and hope that it doesn't cause the damage that you're hearing about now. So let me pray for us, and then... Let's come to communion and let's look forward to the grace that God has for us in our attitudes. Heavenly Father, thank you for this convicting word because I know even this week you've convicted me of attitudes that are sinful, that I don't want perpetuated in my children, that I want interrupted and broken and forgiven and released now through repentance. And so I thank you for as painful it is to know that you had your body broken and your blood shed to forgive, forgive us of that. That is what communion is about. As we come to your communion, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us of the sinful attitudes that we have, comfort us in the area where we need to be comfort us, challenge us where we need to be challenged, encourage us where we need to be encouraged. I pray that no one would fall short of receiving the grace of the Lord at the table today. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.